All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero, uh, the show where we temporarily are not actually coding a game from scratch because I am on RSI leave at the moment. Problem hands. What can you do? Um, someone's got to solve it. Unfortunately, I don't know enough about neurological things to fix it, uh, but hopefully it will get better and uh, we'll see. Anyway, point being, while uh, I am on sort of a no typing hiatus, I do, uh, however, feel like it's worth streaming because people have questions and I can answer those questions. So uh, we've got some and I'm going to do exactly that. Uh, so here's a question that comes in from Trev Newt. They said, what are the pros and cons of baking assets like images into your executable rather than shipping them separately and loading them dynamically. Uh, and what I would say about that is really, um, there, there's none, I guess is what I would say. Uh, and so let me go over that process a little bit uh, for you, it, it, just, to, just to give you a little bit of a feel for it. So <clears throat> on the disk, right, uh, here is my executable, right? <clears throat> see if I can put this over here. Uh, so here's my executable on the disk. So this is, you know, this is my this is my hard drive here. And on the disk, right, uh, I've got this executable, and basically the way this is structured, right, is you know it's a bunch of binary data, but at the top there is some information that says like what the sections are and what kind of executable it is and that sort of stuff. That Windows, it's a specific specific format that Windows uses to store its executables in, and there's actually two of them. Uh, there's one for 32-bit exes and there's one for 64-bit exes. Uh, so actually, they, they kind of revved the format um, in a pretty major way when they went to 64-bit. Uh, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Point being, the exe has some information, and then it's got stuff. Uh, usually, they're called like segments. They'll, they'll be called like the code segment, data segments, things like this. Uh, there's pieces of this executable, and in those pieces of the executable, the, this thing at the top, uh, there's often things that say like what's what's there, or you know there'll be other things that affect it, like a relocation table that does dynamic link loading, that sort of thing. And so, really, all that we're talking about here is if I want to store an image, does it go in another file, right? So here's you know my image file over here. Does it go in another file? Or does it go in the executable? Right. So what's the actual difference between these two things? Okay, uh, one is, uh, you know, the executable <clears throat> uh, is already open, right? You don't have to get a new handle to it. There's no chance it could fail. There's no chance that you can't read from it, right? So it's sort of a little more fault tolerant in the sense that it's already open, you know it's there, and it's already, you know, linked up to you. So getting the image out is you know, uh, basically a known quantity. Someone would have to hack the executable to break that, right? Um, and, uh, and number two is it might be slightly faster in some cases, right? Uh, because the, the, the linker pre, will pre-insert the offset to the image into your code, assuming that's something that you compiled into your code. Uh, and so that, you know, maybe it saves you a little bit of work, but we're talking like a little, little bit of work, right? Like not probably something you would ever care about. So, okay, yeah, you know, those are some pluses, but that's really about it. Um, <clears throat> on the whole, there really isn't much of a difference. So uh, I don't consider that a particularly important thing. Now there is one fringe benefit uh, which is the user can't screw up. If the user wants to move an executable and all the data is also in the executable, they can just move the exe around and that works. Nowadays, users don't tend to do that anymore. Uh, and so they don't even really know about executables, you know, most users, they're just kind of like running something through Steam or downloading something through an app store or whatever. So, you know, it's even less important now than it, that it would have been in the past. So let's talk about perhaps a more interesting issue, which is do I want this or this? <clears throat> right, uh, so here's my image uh, file, right? And this maybe has a bunch of images in it. So maybe I've got A, B, C, D, E, F or something, my images. And then here I've got the same images, uh, but they're in separate files. So let's talk about the difference between basically like packed files and separate files. 
right? So that's a perhaps more interesting difference uh, than the executable one. Because the executable one is like, there's really not that, it's, it, there's not a lot of compelling reasons why you ever would care to put something in executable. It's just not that necessary. Uh, there's not a lot of pros to it. But there are some pros and cons between these two. And that's actually worth noting. Uh, and so the reason for that is that a packed file requires a lot less negotiation with the operating system to use. And that's actually somewhat important. Uh, every time I want to load an image file from a separate image, uh, every time I want to load an image from a separate image file, I have to go through the operating system and it has to do a tremendous amount of work. I'm gonna pass, you know, like file name dot PNG or something, and it's gonna have to go through and figure out, okay, what directory structure I'm in, look for a match for this name, find that match, open it up, generate a handle, insert a thing into the handle table, you know, like blah, 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 blah. There's a tremendous amount of work that has to go on here. And um, when you're talking about having hundreds or thousands of files that might have to get open, that's just a lot of unnecessary traffic back and forth to the operating system, a lot of unnecessary work in the operating system uh, that, that really just did not need to happen, right? It also limits the number of options that you potentially have for overlapping that because uh, you know something like an open call might not be very easy to overlap in terms of multi-threading. You may have to create a separate thread to babysit the open call, blah, 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 blah. There's, there's a whole bunch of extra stuff that happens here. So packed files, there is a pretty good argument for. A packed file is very nice because you open it once and then all you have to ever issue to the operating system from then on is just offset reads. You just say, I wanna read this much from here, just like we're doing in Handmade Hero. And so having a small number of large packed files is usually a better idea for most operating circumstances than lots and lots of separate files. And so typically when you ship, you wanna go with something more like this uh, than something like this uh, for that reason. And typically it's not too hard to patch these if you wanna patch them. You can design um, <clears throat> your packed file format to allow easier patching, or you can do sort of some of the stuff we did in Hammer here where you can just allow it to drop in another pack file and then maybe make some rules about how pack files take precedence over each other, for example. So then the things you wanna update are just in here or whatever. So there's a number of ways I think that you can probably uh, <clears throat> make packing work just as easily, I'm sorry, make patching work fairly easily in a pack file if you're, if you're just a little smart about it uh, than the circumstance that you might see here with the, um, uh, with the separate files where obviously p patching works as easily as possible there because you can always just uh, you know, replace a particular file, but there's just a lot of drawbacks. So I would say typically you, know, you should be able to design your pack file format so that patching I isn't too hard, um, so that basically you know, changing one thing doesn't change the entire file, right? Um, and then, and then I think pack files are a pretty clear choice. Uh, Draco, once you return to coding episode streams, would you recommend new followers tune in even though they haven't caught up with everything in the archive? Uh, that's really for you to decide. I mean, basically people can watch. I would just recommend watching a couple streams, seeing whether you get anything out of it or whether it's just not useful uh, for you to have, you, you know, um, <clears throat> whether it's, you know, not useful for you to see it if you're not all caught up or whether it is. So I would say it's something that you'd probably have to, uh, you know, it's something you'd probably have to decide for yourself. Insofar as, I meant using the built-in Windows voice recognition stuff to program everything. Okay, that would be kind of funny if we tried to use voice activated programming to program Handmade Hero. We probably should try that at some point. Do you think you could create an in-depth video post on IOCP at some point in the near future? I'm having a bit of trouble understanding their amazingness. Uh, not really. I, like I said, I'm pretty full up with work right now and, and not being able to uh, being uncertain about the, the status of the hands, I, I, I really can't do anything other than what I'm doing right now. Elvin, good evening, Sensei. <laughs> Still looks weird to be called Sensei. I hope your hand is feeling better today. 
I salute your positiveness in handling the situation. I would totally freak out if that happens to me. Without programming, I'm practically useless. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I could not agree more. It's It really is very, very frustrating to me, and it upsets me, um, because it's really all I need is for my hands to function well. Uh, <clears throat> basically, like, like, you know, from here up, needs to be functioning well. Um, you know, I could be in a wheelchair and I, it wouldn't really affect my uh, enjoyment of life hardly very much, uh, but losing use of a hand is pretty devastating. So, you know, uh, it, it is hard to keep a positive, to, to keep a positive outlook on it, it's true. And, um, uh, you know, I do what I can, but it's, it's, uh, it's lame. It's really, really lame. And uh, I wish someone would solve these problems because I feel like, you know, it, it's, it's a problem when we have people who are able to program and want to program and are slowed down or even stopped because of stupid biomechanical problems. Like, get me a better interface to a computer. Why am I even using these, right? It's just dumb. Um, so, yeah, I wish they would solve, hurry up and solve that so I could use something else. Um, let's see. Dan Golf, after fiction technology, what are some candidates for other problems, projects worth your time? Um, I haven't really talked very much about anything after that yet. I would say that I'm trying not to be too forward looking with things like that because. Like I said, especially when you think about, you know, how easy it is to be taken out of the game. Uh, interactive fiction is really the thing that I would like to make sure that we solve at Molly. And if we do that, I'll be very satisfied. And if I can still program after that time, then I'll pick something else. But Pragma Script, will there ever be good real-time global illumination? Uh, I don't know. Probably because it's a very separable problem. Um, you know, at the limit, you can have every, you know, pixel rendered by a different computer. And then you can afford to do a full-on, you know, ray trace. I mean, if, if you imagined having, you know, a 64,000 core computer or something, uh, it, it would scale relatively well. And then you would just basically have the memory distribution problem. That uh, would be mostly what you'd have to deal with, which is how do they all access the information. So, you know, could it happen? Probably. Uh, I don't know how likely it'll be. I, I don't know, but it could happen. It could happen. Proton Gaming, why are companies so hard with junior developers in the interview process make it very difficult for unexperienced coders to get a job? Um, probably because there's just a lot of bad programmers out there and they're nervous about it uh, and they don't know what to do. To, they, they, you know, they're, they're misguided in their approach to finding good programmers. You can't blame them for not wanting bad programmers. Bad programmers are really uh, bad to work with, and they ruin everything. Um, so you know, they're they're trying to to not have that happen. And then the hilarious part is, oftentimes they're actually bad programmers. So now you got a bad programmer who's thinking they're pre preventing a bad programmer from getting hired, when actually they're just a bad programmer, which is always hilarious. Um, but uh, you know, what are you gonna do? X13 Pixels, is Martin still putting the videos up on BitTorrent Sync? I don't know what he's doing. I have no idea. I still copy anything I post to the YouTube. I copy it into the shared directory for him. Whether he runs the BitTorrent Sync, I don't know. He was doing that out of the goodness of his heart. Um, and, you know, if he doesn't want to do it anymore, you know, I don't blame him. Uh, but uh, if someone does want to take over that for him, if he doesn't want to do it anymore, I I could uh, get the video. I could uh, set someone up else up so they could get those videos. E Junkie sixty four. You could try something like Qigong Chinese health exercise, which could help with RSI and creating good posture. Just thought, uh, yeah. Um, I actually, I don't know about that specifically, but I do, uh, I am going to try to work on, we're trying to do one thing at a time here just for testing purposes and just to be kind of like a little more systematic about it, but I am going to try adding some exercise routines, just general exercise routines uh, into my day uh, because that's something I really need to do anyway and uh, I'll be trying to do some of that uh, for sure. 
Do you ever wonder if a game you're playing will turn into Frog Fractions 2 with a crazy twist? I find myself wondering this often. Uh, no, I probably should be wondering that. Uh, but no, I have not wondered that yet. In Gennaro, for some reason I remember you saying there were changes coming to HammerHero.org forums that I remember correctly, and do you have any update on the current status? Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, so I am not making any changes to the Handmade Hero forums. Uh, it's just that the people who are doing Handmade Dev wrote a bunch of forum stuff uh, that's in testing right now, and when they're happy with it, the Handmade Hero forums will kind of flip over to those. And they're a lot better, at least I thought they were. Um, you know, everyone has their preferences, I'm sure, but the, they're just they're just better, uh, in my opinion. And so it'll switch over to that when they're ready. And that's not, I don't, I have nothing to do with that process. I just said it, I don't like running forums. I don't like running web things, period. Uh, so I was just like, if you guys want to run the forums, have them. And they were like, yeah. So they've got some plan for that, and I don't know when that'll be, but that's that's what that is. Danny Gwag, what is the Intel architecture thing on your desktop? Oh, um, this is from earlier in the streams. Uh, it, this thing, are you talking about, or this one? So uh, I can tell you what they both are. Uh, they're both very important and things you should know. Uh, so the Intel Intrinsics Guide is a website that's awesome. We use it on the stream when we do optimization. Uh, and basically what it lets you do is search for things. Like it's search for the instructions. Uh, so if you don't know what the intrinsics are, intrinsics are basically compiler uh, things that tell the compiler that you'd like it to generate a specific assembly instruction for you. Uh, and so you can use that to access the SIMD instructions and among other things on, uh, on Intel hardware. And, but there's a lot of intrinsics at this point and they get hard to remember what's what and so you can use this it's pretty efficient you can check like I, I'm programming for SSE 2 that's my target so I want to see like everything that's that and below let's say and then you can search like oh show me the functions that have add in them like something that says that has an add um, uh, or something that that has a load like that does right and it just makes it really easy because there's just a lot of them and it makes it really easy to kind of come see what they all are so it's a really nice uh, it's a really nice resource. Uh, it was actually, I didn't even know about it. Someone recommended it on stream when I was looking them up manually and they were like, hey, you know, there's a great web page. And I'm like, yeah, there is. Um, so that was pretty cool. Then uh, the, the Intel architecture manual, this is the thing you could download. You can download this from Intel's website. It's free. It's, uh, you know, it's a publicly available thing. And what this is, is this is their manual for, for the x86 architecture, which at this point is the x64 architecture. Uh, and what it's got is basically all the information that you need to know about how the instruction set is meant to work. So you can go see like what the rationale for these things is and how they were meant to work and what, how, you know, what their general operating modes are, all those sorts of things. Uh, there's even simp stuff in here about, you know, like how the, the CPU just generally does what it does, what the different, the 64 versus 32 bit memory model, uh, all that stuff, right? And so when you're curious to learn how the chip does what it does, um, fr from a specification standpoint, uh, not from a hardware standpoint, because it's not about that, uh, but from a specification standpoint, this is a great place. And it's got, uh, you know, like the system programming guide in here tells you about stuff that you might want to know if you're programming like an operating system, like how interrupts work. Uh, those are not things that users ever really deal with, but uh, the OS programmers deal with. So it's just got a lot of great information and something that everyone should be familiar with because it, it can answer a lot of questions for you um, if you have a specific question about the chip. Orlando Bloom, have you ever been to GDC? Uh, yes, uh, the first GDC I attended was in 1997. And I attended it up until about 2002, maybe three. Uh, I don't know if I went in three, and then I, I, I believe I went in four and five, uh, to just, just for hosting the programmer's challenge. I didn't really do anything else, but. Orlando Bloom, why is audio such a disaster even on Windows? I don't know, man. People overcomplicating things. I, I, I don't know. The same reason all hardware is a disaster is because the driver layer gets all super complicated and people refuse to keep things simple. Um, 
what, you know, I've never been a device manufacturer. I never worked at an IHV. I don't know how it gets out of control. I think it's like bad decisions on Microsoft side, bad decisions on the IHV side. They compound, they grow and compound and people get bad ideas and then those bad ideas become initiatives. And you know, it's like suddenly you're looking at a USB spec that's 700 pages long and there's like 400 pages of audio spec and you're just like, this is what? Like, um, so I don't know. Huber Caleb, don't installer programs typically bake information about the program they are installing into the exe? Is that how installers are typically done on the Windows? Uh, yeah, so typically what happens, um, and and I could show you guys how to do this. It's it's not hard. In fact, you you if you've watched the series, you already pretty much know how. So um, <clears throat> there's two ways you can actually approach this this problem, uh, and and that is like okay, so you know that you've got the linker, right? We've talked about this way, way back the early days of Handmade Hero. Uh, and so what happens is into the linker, you're shoving a bunch of like OBJ files, right? Uh, and the linker is gonna output an executable, okay? Just like the kind we just talked about. And so we've got these OBJ files there, but it can also grab resource files, right? It can grab stuff like images or whatever, and it can link them in. And so like the Windows has like the resource compiler, it produces res files with like your icons or things like that. So you can get data in there, even if the data wasn't in an object file, you can actually package in other things. And then the linker outputs an executable that has that stuff in Microsoft format with tables that say where it is and blah, 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 right? Great, whatever. However, there's another thing you could do which is once you have your executable, let's say you just make an executable with this process, you don't put anything else in it, it's just code, and now you're like, well, is there any way I could put a bunch of data in there? Like for example, if this was an installer, could I put all the data, all the install packages, and the executable that I'm actually installing, could I just shove all that stuff in there? Because in XE, obviously those installer packages are just one XE, so how does that work? And the answer is, yeah, it's absolutely trivial. Trivial. It's, it's super, super stupid simple, the dumbest thing you could possibly imagine, all you have to do is just take, make a program, you make a little program, uh, you could even do the C runtime library, just a straightforward basic C program, doesn't even require any Windows platform layer, nothing, just a basic C program can do it. All you do is you F read your executable, right? So you read this into memory, very straightforward. You then open a new file, you know, some new exe, that you create, and you F write it. Boom. Okay, so now I've F written this out. I took my old executable, I wrote it here. Then I F read my data files. F read them one at a time, and I append them. So now my exe just grows and grows. I just add on to the end, add on to the end, add on to the end, right? So I'm just F writing, I F read in a new file, I F write it. So I just F read every file in my distribution, and I F write it to the end until I have a giant executable where the first part is my executable and everything that comes after it are all my data files. Right? Make sense? Then what I do is at the very last thing, I put a footer. And the footer is just like our header for our asset tables, but at the end. Then when the executable loads, the executable that I actually wrote, this one here, all it needs to do is when I wrote it, it just needs to have some code in it that opens its own self. It just F opens itself, right? And looks at the last n bytes, reads the footer out of the last n bytes. That footer just has the whole directory structure, everything it needs to grab stuff out. And then it just uses that as its asset pack file from now on, right? So you can actually just do that if you want to. Right? And you can build an installer that way, or you can build a game that way that's just an executable with a bunch of files. You can just totally do that. There's no reason to, really, but you can. And if you were trying to make an installer, then you do have a very good reason to, and you could. Q colon. Is making an interesting game AI considered a very hard problem or are people just lazy? I see most games come with terrible AI these days. Why does it seem we're going backwards? Um, 
I'm really the wrong one to answer that question. Not because I couldn't say some things about a game AI, but actually because I just don't play that many games that are AI-centric in that way. Um, you know, like if you're talking about why can't I play... Uh, why are the enemy players in like Civilization V stupid or something? I'd be like, I don't know because I never played Civilization V. So I, I'm afraid I can't give you a whole lot of... Uh, I got nothing useful to say. I got nothing. Garlando Bloom, is there any difference between EXE installers and MSI installers? Uh, yes, I believe there is. Uh, EXE installers are actually code that's actually running... That's, it's just running the code that's at the front of that file. An MSI installer actually requires Windows to do the installation. So it's more like a data file, if I remember correctly. It's not actually... It's not self... It, it doesn't contain everything in and of itself, which is why they often don't work. Like, I've had tons of MSIs that don't, just actually just don't, straight up don't, don't work, because the machine didn't have the right stuff installed to run the MSI, which is hilarious. Um, so yeah, MSIs, I think, are actually a lot more error-prone than EXEs. Uh, because they actually aren't just a self-contained thing that works. Uh, they're like this weird Microsoft hybrid thing that requires Microsoft's code to do the right thing with it. That's my recollection anyway. That said, I don't really remember the, spe the specifics of it, uh, so maybe that's complete nonsense. That's just my recollection. Really, 91... I'm no doctor, but couldn't it be that the wrist braces you are using, you use actually make your muscles in that part weaker? Uh, yes, it definitely could be. And um, what I can say is that the wrist braces were very effective for most of my life, like 10 years or so of programming. And so uh, I know that they were very good for a certain set of things, but they may not really have been a great idea and maybe uh, I should stop using them. And that is one thing that we will be testing. I think what I may... For all I know, the only thing they really did for me, too, was keep my hands warm. And so one thing I was thinking is going to just a hand warmer thing. Because sometimes that helps with, like, arthritic tendonitis things is to keep it warm. Uh, and so we'll see. But, y yes, uh, it is absolutely possible. I don't know if it's likely or probable, but yes. Gary Johansson, possibly uh, too big of a question, but is there an ideal known strategy to make a natural language processing system, e.g. you type English and that parses into actions that are enacted by a program? Um, <clears throat> I am not up on the state of the art. I used to be. About 10 years ago, I could have told you a better answer. Um, the answer used to be that uh, the current best stuff was statistical. So the best stuff that they had for processing natural language was uh, they would take giant corpuses of language uh, that had been annotated. <clears throat> so for example, there's a Wall Street Journal corpus uh, that has like tons and tons and tons of Wall Street Journal articles that have been hand annotated by linguists with what the parts of speech were and stuff like this. And so they were able to do statistical using that as sort of like a data mine they were able to do statistical analyses on it to like help inform the decisions because the problem with parsing English, right, is that you end up with the situation where you kind of need world knowledge to make the right decision and programming the world knowledge in is hard. And so they were using statistics to kind of overcome that. They were saying, well, if it usually means this, then in the presence of these other things, then I'll assume then that's the truth, blah, 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 right? And so that used to be. Whether that's the case now, I don't know. I haven't looked at it in a while. Gary Johansson, we could do an experiment where you tell us what to make and you review. We could. That's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea. We'll see what happens. Like I said, I'll try maybe to, you know, this week and next week we'll do, you know, we'll do no typing streams, but then we'll, I'll see. I'm hoping maybe at that point I'd be ready to, to start going again, but if I'm not, then we'll, we'll get more creative. Uh, SSS McGrath, have you spoken to Chris Crawford about it? I'm assuming that the it is interactive fiction technology? But I don't know. Uh, and the answer is yes. I did speak to him about it. I spoke to him about it in 1999, I want to say. Uh, <clears throat> and 
While there is a gigantic story there that I will probably tell someday, let's simply say that he and I share literally zero of the same opinions about how interactive fiction technology should work. Like literally zero. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Imminent threat. How would you describe your learning curve over your decades of programming experience? For me, no matter how long I do something, I always seem to look back to where I was a year before and feel like there was much less competent version of myself. Um, I would say that's very accurate, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, basically, what I have found is that uh, it probably looks a little something like this for me. Uh, where like you you sort of grow very rapidly for a time and then at some point you hit like a language asymptote uh, which is like you're never gonna get any better in C++ like forget it C++ is just fundamentally limited and so it's just a problem right uh, and so to really like the next time I'll be able to do this again um, again assuming my hands hold out uh, is uh, is when I fully switch over to my own stuff. Because uh, right now I have like a hybrid beta programming thing. I feel like when I finally switch over to something that's completely custom, no more C++, uh, I'll be able to do this again. But until then, I think I'm, I'm pretty much just like, this is the C++ standards committee, right? Um, being basically preventing me from ever getting any better because they won't give me anything useful to use. Uh, have you played Starship Titanic? I thought that had quite a cool interactive conversation thing, especially for a 1998 game. I don't think so insofar as I may have missed that one because it doesn't ring a bell. And I, I try to play, that's, that's maybe a little late for my time, which is maybe why I missed it. Um, could you send me a link to that? Email me a link to that if you get a chance. If it's like on GOG or something, I'll go check it out. Elvin, related to the question about embedded resources versus external ones, I had an idea of using a meta program to load a model during a preprocessor step and spit out the code that assigns the vertices values directly to an array, uh, etc. Do you think that's useful in any way? Um, not really. Because the code necessary to do that is going to be a lot more... Uh... Oh, well, if you're just talking about trying to bake it in, then yeah, it could be useful. I mean, people do that for fonts, right? If you're just talking about baking it into the executable by putting it in an array, yeah, uh, if you want that model to just be in your code for some reason where you don't want to load it out of a file ever, and you want it to just sort of get loaded as part of the executable, maybe for reliability purposes, so it, you know it can never get separated, it always has to be there, um, for some reason. People do that with fonts. Like, the font that you need to use, say, to print out can't load asset file, for example, might need to be baked into the executable because what if you can't load the asset file, you can't get a font out of it to display the error message that says that you can't load the font, right? Um, so if you're not on a system like Windows where you could just use a message box or something and have Windows deal with it, if you're on some platform where you have to do everything yourself, you could see why you might need to bake something in because if the asset file is not there, how do you report it at that point, right? C voucher might be jumping the gun since we haven't gotten to shaders, but I'm having trouble with them in my renderer. Am I supposed to save the attributes and shader programs across draw calls or reinitialize each time? Seems like you went to a lot of trouble to remove the transient arena from the OpenGL renderer so things can't be pushed from there. Uh, so. I guess I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. In OpenGL, uh, there's there's more than one way that it happens. Um, there's things called SSBOs, there's things called UBOs, and there's things uh, that are just uniforms. Uh, and the answer to what you're, how it's going to work depends on that. If you're just talking about setting uniform variables, uh, then the shader program... Oh wait, are you talking about Actually, there's the program handle. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but I guess what I would say here is um, 
what you want to do for shaders is they need to be saved. So they are going to be an asset class. And what I would say is you're going to have to wait till we do our final pass because uh, we got to go do our texture download stuff. That way that that works will probably be roughly how the shaders should work. Meaning it's stored, it is stored. And you only want to build the shader once. Attributes you have to switch often, so you can't necessarily build those in. Um, but if you're talking about just the attribute locations, then yeah, all that stuff should get stored. You only want to do it once because it doesn't change. Sorry, I think I got confused. I wasn't sure what you were asking. I think I know what you're asking now. The answer is yes, you, you want to save it. Because it costs. Compiling costs a lot. So you don't, once you want to allow the GL to compile your shader once, you don't want to do it every frame. That's real bad. So what PDF reader is that? That is Sumatra PDF. All right, only two minutes left here. Two minutes left, what do we got? Uh, Elvin, why is it in C++ that people always like to do many compilation units, one for each CPP file? <clears throat> is it just because of how Visual Studio Build works? Um, I don't know. I really don't. <clears throat> I think it's because of a misguided impression that keeping things separated by file logically per class uh, has some kind of conceptual purity to it. But really all they're doing is making their build times awful. So having lots of files is something you only do if you haven't actually sat down to do the work of figuring out how to make your turnaround time low, um, in my opinion and keeping your build working efficiently. Uh, because even if you want to do incremental compilation, you don't want them that small. Uh, because you almost always, when you touch a header file, end up having to compile multiples of them, right? And so it, it's not a very good idea in my opinion, but yeah, it's somehow it got into people's heads and that's what they do. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. Cuber Caleb, won't antiviruses get finicky with you writing to the end of an exe? Doesn't that also break code signing? Um, so, yeah, I mean, like I said, I'm not advocating that you do that. I'm just saying that you can. Antivirus uh, programs might get finicky with you writing to the end of an exe, but that's okay because you're doing that on your dev machine. You can just turn the antivirus off. So it's only the reading that happens on the client side, so that's fine. As for breaking code signing... I don't know, it depends on the codes. It depends on which code signing you're talking about. Mm, let's see, I'll take one more question. Cubercalab, is it practical to roll your own C runtime? Yes, it is. Uh, from what I've gathered, there seems to be a lot of problems with that sort of thing. Of course, MS has Audacity to ship incompatible versions of the CRT on different versions of Windows. Any work on this? Uh, static linking solves that problem for you. Uh, that's why we do it on Handmade Hero. But uh, yeah, uh, at Molly, we ship without the CRT now. Uh, so our game, our game runs no, no CRT. And I shipped Granny. Granny had a no CRT option as well. When I shipped that at Rad, that was always no CRT uh, for um, for all that stuff. Yeah. Boondoggle forty two. Have you considered guest programmers for the interim? Uh, if, like I said, if I have to, if it goes more than a month uh, of me not being able to do it, then then I'll we'll do something. I'm not sure what, but we will. Uh, but I'm still, you know, cautiously optimistic. Because um, really, all I need to do, you know, to be honest, it doesn't really bother me. If, if my hands are numb or something, um, even. So it's really just verifying that I'm not gonna lose use of the hands by using them is really all I need to get. That's, that's as far as I actually need to get, you know? Uh, so, uh, so we're still working on it, we'll see what happens. All right, I think that's it for tonight. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's about it. 
All right. All right. I'm going to close it down for now. I'm going to close it down for now. Save this up. And all right, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It has been a pleasure coding with you, even though we were not actually coding. So I guess it's a pleasure chatting with you as always. Uh, if you would like uh, to come back tomorrow for more chatting, we will be here at 5.30 uh, p.m., same time, uh, same place. So love to see you. If you enjoy the chats, uh, it's good hanging out. Uh, it's great to see so many people here, even though we're not programming. Uh, so if you've got questions, bring them tomorrow. We'll try to take one or two pretty serious ones every day, and then otherwise we'll just chat. Um, and I'll start uploading these guys as well to the YouTube, so if people want to catch up on the on the chat streams, they can do that too. I won't put them as day numbers. I'll do them as like chat zero, chat one, or something like that. Uh, so that you don't get confused with stuff where we're actually coding. And that's about it. Uh, I will see you guys tomorrow. Until then, uh, please have fun programming, even if I can't. Uh, and I'll see you guys on the internet. Take it easy, everyone.